So today let's take a look what's inside of this donated power supply for LEDs and how does it work. Big thanks for the donation and now let's explore it. It works with these eight LED stripes. Each of them produces 1700 lumens. The maximum current is 540 milliamps. The maximum voltage 40 volts. 95 degrees Celsius maximum. Each of them contains 36 LEDs and they seem to be 3 in a parallel and 12 in a series. Each of them probably drops about 3 volts. They don't seem to be multi-chip, so 12 in a series would be about 36 volts. And I guess all these panels were connected in series, which in total would drop almost 300 volts. And the power supply says the output power is 150 watts, the input 159 watts, so it seems 9 watts is lost in it. The input voltage is 220 to 240 volts. The output is 100 to 300 volts DC. The input current is 0.72 amps. And the output current seems to be from 0.2 to 0.7 amps DC. So is it dimmable? The frequency 50 or 60 Hz or DC. The case temperature and ambient temperature range. Power factor 0.9 capacitive. Touch dim. I guess it has to communicate with some dimmer controller. Output not main is isolated. This is good to know, of course. It seems the output voltage is always lower than the rectified main voltage. This time is 1.414. So it might be a back regulator. Even though for 150 watts, you'd expect some power factor correction, especially for this power factor. So it might be a boost converter power factor correction and then a back regulator for the LEDs. And here it says LED output. The maximum voltage is 330 volts. It has the LED connections, positive and negative. LED set, ground set. It's probably to set the brightness. Is this some antenna for some wireless brightness setting? And life neutral ground. And maybe some connection to some dimmer controller. We will try to power it. Not sure if it can work without the dimmer controller. We can do some measurements and then take a look inside of it. I wired it all in a series. There are these push-in contacts for wires. And also jumpers on this side between the boards. On this side it looks this way. Now of course my dodgy test plug with crocodile clips and let's test it. And it's actually working! Nice! Now of course a flicker test switching the camera to 24 frames a second. Am I going to see a flicker? No visible flicker. Now let's try to measure the voltage drop of one LED. 2.76 volts. Sort of a low voltage drop for a white LED, isn't it? Probing another, it's very similar. One stripe is 33 volts. And the total is 266 volts. And putting a current meter in series with the LEDs and the LED current is 323 milliamps. Of course, to get the LED power, you multiply this in amps by the voltage. 0.323 amps times 266 volts. Total voltage drop of the LEDs gives about 85, almost 86 watts. Which is not the full 150 watts. But I guess some communication with the dimming controller is necessary to set it to the maximum power. Now it seems to be running at about 57% of the full power. Now let's plug it into my DIY watt meter. And the power drawn from a minus is 92.3 watts. And dividing the output power by the input power gives me about 93% efficiency. But just a side note, measuring the efficiency of power supplies this way, especially when they're very efficient, can have a huge error. Imagine a power supply where 100 watts go in and 99 watts go out. And this would be 99% efficient. But if your meter at the output is plus half a percent off, you're reading 99.5 watts output and it gives you 99.5% efficiency and the loss instead of 1 watt appears to be half a watt. Half a percent error of the meter here gives you a 50% error estimating the loss of the power supply. If your meter is plus 1% off, the power supply already appears to be 100% efficient, which is impossible. And if the meter at the input is minus 1% off, it's then reading 99 watts. And the efficiency appears to be 101%, which makes it look like it's producing 1 watt out of nowhere instead of losing 1 watt. 2 meters, each of them is 1% off, and your loss measurement is 200% off. The errors of the meters are adding up, but on top of it, they're multiplied by a massive factor. In this case a factor of 100, because the loss is a hundredth. Now let's measure the main voltage waveform and the current waveform on a current sensing resistor. And let's see the phase shift and the harmonic distortion. The yellow is the voltage 
and the current is the blue and there is not much harmonic distortion so there has to be a power factor correction and it's mostly in phase but the current is slightly leading, slightly capacitive looking at the DLED current, a current sensing resistor in a series with the DLEDs and there seems to be no sign of a ripple I mean no sign of a 100 Hz ripple but of course some high frequency noise on it but now of course everybody is screaming open the power supply so let's open the power supply the cover just clicks on it and that's it the cover, this insulation and all of the internals show up and the board also clicks in I guess and the should come out and that's it and of course there seem to be no power transistors on this side I guess they are here under these pads, thermally conductive pads, coupling the heat to the housing. And the mains comes in here, it seems, to class Y capacitors, some metal oxide varistors for over voltage protection, I guess. Here's some transistor, some other small transistors, optocouplers, a bridge rectifier, the interference suppression filter with two windings, a common mode filter, some class X capacitors, some more inductors in the life and a neutral, probably. One inductor, I guess this is the boost power factor correction. Some capacitors, they actually appear to be in a series, not in a parallel. Each of them 350 volts. So the power factor correction boosts the rectified mains to a significantly higher voltage, it seems. And then it's going through a buck regulator, regulating a constant current for the LEDs and some capacitors probably parallel to the LEDs. There is also an inductor here, maybe an interference suppression at the output, some transistor which seems to disconnect the LEDs if necessary, and a lot of small control circuitry. Here is some chip, another 8 pin chip here. It seems to have two fuses, 3.15 amps for the main thing and a 1 amp fuse for some sort of control interface. There is also a bridge rectifier on it, two optocouplers, each of them facing a different direction. And there is an NTC thermistor for inrush current limitation and it seems one of these two transistors then bypasses it. The other transistor is switching the boost power factor correction circuit and here is its diode. And the small bridge rectifier is for the control interface. The bridge rectifier for the main thing is made of discrete diodes here. And the output section for the LEDs, I was thinking it's a buck regulator but it's probably not. There are two transistors in a half bridge and also two big diodes. I have to try to reverse engineer it. Of course I'm not going to reverse engineer the entire thing but at least the power section of it without the control circuitry. And of course I should make some close-up here are the fuses, some capacitors, metal oxide varistors, some transistor, the bridge rectifier, this inductor, the optocouplers, the inductors, X capacitors, the NTC thermistor, the power factor correction inductor, the circuitry between it, the control circuitry here and then the thing for the LEDs the markings of the chips might be actually visible now and at the mail here the LED transformer or inductor and the output section with this transistor here and the other side these diodes the transistors here Smaller circuitry here, SMD components, the power factor correction diode, the transistor, the NTC thermistor bypass transistor, and the bridge rectifier. And something at the interface here. And there seems to be also some remote control or interface. There is an antenna under this plastic cover, and it goes into, I guess, this chip. And there are also some circuitry hiding under these capacitors. All four power transistors here seem to be the same type. And here's the simplified schematic of it. The mains comes in via a fuse here. Here's the metal oxide varistor for over voltage protection, some interference suppression inductors, an X capacitor for interference suppression, this common mode interference suppression filter, and these two inductors. I thought one is in a neutral, one is in live, but they're both in a series in a neutral for some reason. These two capacitors in parallel, again X capacitors, these Y capacitors going from live and from neutral to ground. That's the interference suppression plus over voltage protection. And then it goes into the active power factor correction part. 
there's a bridge rectifier, then the inrush current limiting thermistor and TC, which is then to reduce the losses bypassed using this MOSFET, and there is also a metal oxide varistor protecting this MOSFET, then the high frequency decoupling capacitor typical for power factor correction circuits, enough to decouple high frequency but not enough to smooth 100 Hz ripple, here is the active power factor correction inductor with the main winding and some auxiliary winding. Here is the ultra fast diode and two ferrite beads. The power factor switching MOSFET and the current sensing resistors for it. The two electrolytic capacitors in series and the film, probably polypropylene capacitor in parallel to reduce the high frequency impedance. And here is the inrush current bypass diode. The inrush current of these capacitors goes via this diode so it doesn't go through the inductor and saturate it potentially damaging the transistor, and also the ultra-fast diode might be more sensitive to an inrush than a standard diode. And here's the LED driver section, with another capacitor parallel to the supply rail, and here's the half bridge for some reason. It seems to be basically a synchronous back regulator, even though I don't get it why for such a high voltage they have to use a synchronous back regulator. And they could have used just a diode here instead of a transistor. It's working with several hundred volts and a voltage drop of a diode would be absolutely negligible. There's again a current sensing resistor made of three in a parallel. Here is the main output inductor with two auxiliary windings, a capacitor, an extra inductor for better high frequency ripple suppression, another capacitor, then some resistor for voltage sensing to sense the voltage drop of the LEDs going into some circuitry, and then a protection diode going into the positive of the LEDs and the negative goes again via some protection diode via this transistor, which I guess is also some sort of a protection it can disconnect the LEDs and the transistor is protected using a metal oxide varistor again and then this set of current sensing resistors, two groups and one of them can be apparently bypassed using a tiny transistor and this is probably how the current regulation works for the dimming, this transistor can bypass these resistors, reducing the resistance of the current sensing resistor and increasing the current. I guess this transistor can actually work in a linear region. Probably the series combination of these two groups of resistors sets the minimum current. And when the transistor is fully on, just this group sets the current, that's the maximum current or maximum brightness. It's a weird way of dimming it. Now let's try to measure the voltage here and do some oscilloscope measurements in it. And the voltage after the power factor correction is 409 volts. After the startup, the NTC thermistor bypass MOSFET gets just a DC voltage on its gate. About 11 volts. The gate of this one in reference to this. And the power factor correction transistor gate and drain. Of course it's dynamically changing as the 100 Hz ripple the rectified minus voltage goes up and down. Every time I freeze it, it's showing a bit different duty cycle and frequency. The frequency keeps shifting between about 100 kHz and 116 or 17. The gate of this one and the drain of this one. And the probe ground does go here. Of course the oscilloscope's isolated from a mains. It's battery powered, so I can probe something that's not isolated from a mains. Of course making the entire oscilloscope life at minus voltage in the process. Let's probe into the half bridge, the gate of the lower MOSFET and the output of the half bridge. That's the lower MOSFET gate, the peak voltage is about 12 volts or 13. And the 400 volt peak to peak square wave at the output of the half bridge. And the frequency seems to be about 85 or 86 kilohertz. And now the gates of these two transistors. And the bigger one, the high voltage one, seems to always have about 12 point something volts on its gate. It's always on. Now the other channel probing the other one. It has some voltage on its gate. I guess it's working in the linear region. That's about 3 volts. And here's the 100 Hz rectified minus ripple and the drain of the power factor correction transistor. Let's trigger near the top of the rectified sine wave and zoom in. At the maximum voltage the switching frequency seems to be about 70 kHz here. This is not easy to trigger too of course. And the duty cycle is low. Let's freeze it. This is the duty cycle here. Now let's zoom back out and let's try to trigger to the minimum voltage of the rectified sine wave. And zoom in. And at the minimum voltage the frequency seems to be 180 kHz. It's higher and the duty cycle is also higher. The transistor is basically on most of the time. Which makes sense when it's boosting from quite a low voltage to quite a high voltage, about 410 volts. Now the yellow channel was this and the blue channel this. This switching chip is probably the auxiliary power supply for the other chips as a back regulator using this inductor, it's not isolated. And this chip is a half bridge driver. 
not sure what this is. This one and this one. There's quite a lot of it in it. There is also several five pin chips. This one, then this thing and this thing. Does this control the power factor correction? And something near the optical isolators for the interface, I guess. That's the 10 pin chip the auxiliary power supply, which can be used with a transformer, but. Also, with just an inductor as a back regulator. And that's the half bridge driver, high voltage, high and low side driver. It has two inputs and two outputs for the gates. And the high side MOSFET driver basically flies up and down with the voltage to the output of the half bridge. The outputs of the chip could drive the gates directly, but here they're using this circuit for each gate to basically discharge it faster via this amplifying PNP transistor. So the gate is basically charged straight from the chip via this diode, but discharged faster using this transistor at a higher current than the chip can sink. That's the circuit here and here for each gate. And I was even thinking, isn't this circuit somehow resonating, these inductors with these capacitors? But I guess it's driven way above its resonant frequency. So most of the AC voltage is on the inductors, and these capacitors have mostly just the DC on them. And on top of it I noticed one of them has an anti-parallel diode. You don't know the inductance of the first inductor, but the second one is 330 microhenry. And the capacitor is 470 nanofarads, so I can calculate using my calculator its resonant frequency, which is 12 kHz. So 86 kHz is way above the resonance. I can also check what capacitor would be necessary to resonate with this inductor at 86 kHz, and it would be just 10 nano. So this is quite far from resonance. Somebody must be screaming at the computer connect the oscilloscope to the capacitors. The first one has a little bit of a ripple on it, the second one no visible ripple, because it has the second inductor in front of it. But on both capacitors the AC ripple is just a small fraction of the DC voltage on them, as I expected. And the capacitor voltage is in AC only mode, 1 volt per division. This thing is so complex that there is almost an unlimited amount of things to explore. But the video is getting bloody long. And it's interesting how lighting technology progressed from simple things like this, or this, or this, to something as overcomplicated as this. It's definitely more efficient, more convenient, maybe more environmentally friendly, even though with the amount of components, not sure about that. And a bit unsettling, we went from something produced locally to something produced on a different continent. Well, it might say made in Poland, but all the components in it are definitely not. But anyway, at least it can teach you a lot about electronic circuits, and you can also take some useful components from it. That's it, and if you like my videos, please consider supporting this channel on a Patreon, using the thanks button and subscribing, because these videos are laborious to make, and this channel couldn't exist without your support. And big thanks to all of you who already support me.